Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining. Uh, welcome to uh, signing with Ethereum. Uh, so my name is Lang. I am an investor with Strat Crypto. We are based uh, out of LA, a crypto native uh, VC fund focused on the seed stage. Um, joined by an amazing group of panelists today. Uh, why don't we do a quick round of intros? Let's learn how uh, what you guys are building and uh, let's kick off. Awesome. Uh, hi, everyone. It's really great to be here. Um, my name is Justina, and uh, I am a developer success lead at Three Box Labs. Um, Three Box Labs is a, a company behind a project called Ceramic. Uh, Ceramic is a decentralized data layer that is uh, bringing composable data to Web3 applications. And uh, we are basically trying to build out um, the infrastructure and uh, APIs that uh, developers can use to easily store, access, um, uh, modify their data. And uh, the key concept that we are trying to bring to Web3 is composable data, uh, which means that data that is stored on a ceramic network can easily be repurposed, reused for different applications. Um, so yeah, um, specifically about me, I lead developer success at Three Box Labs. Before joining the team, I spent most of my career in data science, machine learning, and AI applications, basically helping open source companies to um, build tools that enable developers to build um, AI and machine learning systems without sacrificing their data ownership. So super excited to be part of this panel. Hi. Um, I think we're going to... No, we're good with that. I thought we were going to cause a lot of feedback there. Uh, it's going to go off in everyone's ears. So I'm Shiv Malik. I, I'm the uh, CEO and co-founder of Pool. Uh, I used to be an investigative journalist for The Guardian um, for about half a decade. Uh, so a weird sort of intro, in a sense, uh, or a route into Web3. Uh, but uh, been around since about 2017, so I guess I... Do I get to be an OG now, Nick? I think so, yeah. yeah. Oh, wow, okay. Um, so... <laughs> Uh, I'll tell you a little about Pool. What we're doing is we're building out a stack uh, for date, these things called data unions, which help people aggregate and share data. There's a good number of them uh, around now, including uh, Demo uh, and uh, Swash, um, Ozone. I mean, I could just list uh, about 120 of them. So, uh, and specifically, we're also building out an application. Is that Faris? It is. Hi. Um, an application that can uh, help store your data in a data wallet. Uh, if you want, I think sort of EOA wallets as they exist at the moment are, you know, sort of level 1.0. They're a bit, they're a bit dumb as applications. Can we make them more intelligent? And obviously, signing in with Ethereum becomes that gateway to opening out that information sharing. Uh, hi, I'm Nick Johnson. Uh, founder and lead developer of the Ethereum name service, ENS, uh, which helped fund uh, sign in with Ethereum and started the whole process going. So ENS has been evolving from purely a name lookup service into a, your decentralized Web3 profile. So we're very, very interested in pushing that forward with things like sign in with Ethereum. Perfect. Thank you. All right. So why don't we kick off with some you know, history behind signing in with Ethereum and maybe compare and contrast with the, our Web2 counterparts and signing in with Google and Facebook and, and the like. Uh, let's start with Nick. Yeah, so uh, sign in with Ethereum started as an effort uh, between ENS and the Ethereum Foundation. Uh, we sort of identified the need for a native sign-in protocol. Where there were dozens of different implementations of uh, signing in using signing a, a message with your wallet. They were all different. Many had security issues, many had usability issues. And we sort of thought, you know, this would be an awful lot better if it was consistent and, and uh, identical across all systems. Wallets would be able to build in support for it with better UX for users. Uh, sites would be able to use reusable components. Um, and so we got together with the Ethereum Foundation to, uh, to get that going. We put out an RFP, uh, got a number of submissions, and Spruce were the ones who won the RFP, and they've done an outstanding job of building the standard and, and getting it out there. Perfect, perfect. Uh, let's maybe double click on that a little bit more um, in terms of comparing and contrasting like, you know, the back end with, you know, the data analytics and what happens behind the scenes. Uh, Shiv, do you want to take that one? Well, actually, it was going to come at a slightly different angle, which is from the, in fact, the exact opposite end, the UX side of things. Um, and it's worth remembering, obviously, we, you know, a lot of people here have 
have signed in with Google, signed in with Facebook. I don't think it's kind of a pleasurable experience because you're sort of wary of the fact that, yeah, you know, someone else is a centralized party in all of this, someone you might not appreciate, but yeah, it's so convenient, right? It's so much more convenient than signing in with your email and then trying to remember that damn password for that specific application. And if obviously you want to have uh, any sort of security over passwords, it's, it's, uh, you're then left with like 15, 20, 50 passwords, right? Mm -hmm. And that becomes a problem, massive problem in and of itself. So I remember this moment when I could sign in with Ethereum with Uniswap. I think that was my first time when I really appreciated what was going on. And I was like, my God, this is exactly what I've always wanted, right? It's this really happy moment where you're like, it's my wallet and someone else is recognizing my wallet address. And somehow now I've kind of been onboarded in this decentralized fashion. Um, and it's brilliant, it's just brilliant. And it was just that, that's, and I just thought, God, this is definitely the future. And this is a really, in a sense, underrated protocol. Where can it go next? Um, in terms of maybe uh, interoperability and multi-chain and, and kind of carrying that you know, ENS name across multiple domains and, and you know, wrapping your, your identity and kind of self-sovereignty um, with that. Uh, could you talk to maybe what are the possibilities here in terms of use cases and just, you know, what are we building towards right now? I'd start with uh, Justino. Um, yeah, overall we do see um, a lot of interest in terms of um, building more secure applications in general. So um, any kind of, I would say, data layer provider, including Ceramic, I think they should definitely consider using uh, sign-in with Ethereum as one of the options that they can provide for um, um, the users of the applications that are built on uh, these projects. Um, uh, because if we are, I think we're still in quite early stages of where uh, Web3 data is, uh, especially if we go beyond just like financial transactions. So if we are building this layer right now, we really have to think about how that relates to decentralized identity, security, and things like that. And uh, sign in with Ethereum has a lot of advantages in that area. I think we'll cover that a little bit more as well. Um, but um, we do see um, a lot of interest and use cases uh, from uh, verifiable credentials and, uh, and uh, reputation side of things. Uh, for example, uh, Gitcoin, they just re uh, quite recently released Gitcoin Passport and they are also leveraging sign in with Ethereum to allow users to uh, sign in. Um, what I'm specifically quite excited about is um, sign in with Ethereum overall um, the way it handles uh, did generation and um, um, identity overall, uh, it can be paired with additional tools that enable session management. And I believe that that opens so many opportunities for um, a bit more mature and more interactive applications to be, to be built out there. So I really hope that we will see um, some really interesting use cases in uh, Web3 gaming, uh, also Web3 social that uh, require a little bit more uh, user interaction and uh, with sign in with Ethereum, you don't really have to, and session management, you don't have to approve every single action that you um, um, run on uh, while interacting with the application. So I think that will be uh, super interesting to see. and. Um, Another thing that is really nice to see as well is that we see some uh, Web2 native applications adopting sign-in with Ethereum as well. Uh, for example, um, uh, discourse forums, they already have a plugin that um, users can um, uh, use basically to sign in with their Ethereum wallet, which is great. And I just really hope that we will see more um, these Web2 native applications as well using it because it's a great standard to adopt. Shiv, anything to add to that? Oh, I mean, so many things. Um, <laughs> it's worth saying that the, picking up on that point about session management, it's so important when, you know, it's worth going back maybe in history uh, to kind of Netscape uh, and then creating the cookie, right, in order to get some kind of user convenience in regards to session management. And if you think about it, cookies have been, I mean, they've just been terrible. They're, they're, as a piece of technology, they are, they are awful. They don't actually really do the job that they've also been employed to do, which is, basically kind of spying by proxy. Uh, and of course now third party cookies are being shut down 
um, by Chrome in, you know, well, they've delayed it twice now. Uh, so Web 2's got this problem too. Uh, and in fact, just generally speaking, you know, in terms of uh, the, the, the internet at large, not just uh, Web 3, we've had this issue of, you know, what is my identity on the internet? Uh, is it my email? Is it my mobile number? Like, you know, uh, where, or is it some centralized identity via Google and Facebook? And I think this is really the perfect solution, which is via sign in with Ethereum, here's my wallet address, right? It's something I own, it's something I port with me, uh, and it actually works on both sides of that relationship. Because obviously publishers of websites want to know, well, who are you? Who are you? Are you the same person that showed up before? In which case, at least in the very least, this is going to make this convenient for you because we can pull up all that session management stuff from before, right? Here are your preferences. Great. Um, so I, I think there's just, there's just so much opportunity as well with cookies disappearing, right? This is the replacement in that sense for that identity aspect of cookies and session management. It's very exciting. Nick, anything else? Uh, I guess it's worth drilling down a little bit on uh, why we need something like sign with Ethereum in the first place because, uh, you know, Ethereum... Uh, serverless apps, you know, your typical smart contract interaction, you don't need to authenticate yourself to the app because you're authenticating yourself with the transactions you make. So it's when, only when things with back-end services that aren't the chain uh, become important that you start to need the sign-in thing. And so I think, you know, this wasn't a part of the core Ethereum layer simply because initially apps were very focused on directly their on-chain backends. And as apps have become more sophisticated, they've wanted to have uh, integrate other systems, authenticate with legacy systems and so on. It's become more and more important to do this. But because it wasn't built in, the initial solution was very ad hoc and, and so forth. And so we needed a sort of a standardization moment to help move that forward. Um, I guess talking about the cross-chain thing too, um, you know, the, the ENS is well suited to the integration here, and obviously I'm going to shell ENS, but <laughs> um, because ENS supports multi-chain identities and so forth, so you can authenticate using sign with Ethereum and you import your profile, uh, which has addresses for whatever chain you're using or none at all. Uh, so why don't we talk through uh, some, some of the additional traction currently and, and maybe some barriers to, to adoption, you know, why hasn't some things picked up? You know, what are some major hurdles we have to work through? Uh, let's start with Justina. Um, yeah, so in general, it's fairly new-ish uh, concept. So obviously, uh, I think we will see more, uh, more adoption and more traction in Web3 first. Um, I also think that um, for, especially for, let's say, bigger institutions um, to adopt something like sign-in with Ethereum, um, there are quite a few things. They, in general, I think still need a little bit more conviction that um, these kind of protocols are reliable and scalable and, and safe, especially I'm just thinking what would it take for a big, um, let's say, healthcare company or in insurance company to adopt something like that to allow users to log into their systems. Um, and there are a few things, yeah, I think they still need a little bit more conviction that these um, systems are secure, reliable, and also um, I think there is still um, an unsolved problem of users managing their keys. Mm -hmm. uh, so we obviously shift so much responsibility to the user and then not to, not to do some silly things with their uh, private keys. So uh, having good solutions there and, and uh, having reliable experience for both, um, let's say, companies and the users is important. Um, and um, yeah, overall, uh, that also boils down to, in general, I think, education uh, for people to understand, uh, let's say, if we speak about mass adoption, um, understanding why they should care, uh, should care, what happens with their data when they, they sign into um, application using their Facebook or, or Google account, like, what does it mean for, for their identity, their data that they share uh, online. Um, and uh, and the last thing that I think I would like to mention is user experience. Um, um, this is super important, and as Shiv mentioned, that's one of the biggest advantages that uh, the two single sign-on uh, methods have. It's so simple, so easy. You just click a few buttons, and you're in, and uh, it's it's great. So we have to make sure that. Um, for Web3 solutions, we strive for at least similar experience or even better. Um, so I think 
overall the standardized message that um, sign in with theorem produces it's already a really great step towards that direction it's easy to understand for the user they know what kind of um, things they are signing up for what what permissions they're giving to the application so um, yeah we just really have to make sure that um, overall UX improves and is as good as web 2 or, or even better as well do you have anything else yeah um Obviously, the, the title of this talk is the most powerful protocol in Web3, question mark, because I think it's obviously really underrated in terms of use cases right now. Um, it, Lang, it's worth asking the audience who's signed in with Ethereum uh, in the last, like, I don't know, week or ever. Who's a frequent daily user? Wow, that's pretty good. Oh. Okay, that's good. That's, that's, I guess it's how it should be for a conference where <laughs> everyone presumably has got an Ethereum address. Um, I mean, in terms of usage right now, I mean, this morning, just taking today for me, I signed in to um, Aave, uh, in a sense, and I was able to, to realize that my health factor uh, was, was really low and I might need to borrow some money um, <laughs> to prop up my margin call. Uh, and then the second thing I did was sign in to the, the app for this conference, which was great. Uh, uh, and obviously now it remembers, uh, and I'm able to personalize that experience, right? So that's sort of brilliant. And I do, you know, various things like that on a, on a regular basis. Um, but where this goes, I mean, Justina mentioned key management. Um, it, it's, I was listening to a podcast and I think there were, there's still eight addresses which have never pulled out their Ethereum from the original crowd sale. And that's because they lost their keys. So if Ethereum devs, right, back in whenever it was 2015, can't manage their keys, how do we like, expect ordinary people to do it? Um, so that's a huge problem. But I think I'd like to see the stage where you know, people are signing into, let's say, the Wall Street Journal. And, uh, 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 and they're able to make micropayments, right, because they're on an L2, for paying for an article. And I want that to be on that list of options, right? Sign in with Google, Facebook, and Siwi, right? Sign in with Ethereum. I just want it to be there. That, that's, I think, where, where I, and, I, and I, in a sense, I don't see why we're not too far off of that. Once you've got the ability to make micropayments, then the other side have got an incentive to start installing uh, the SDKs that kind of make this happen, in a sense. Yeah, I think I, I just want to echo that. Like, the, the getting more integration with Web2 apps is going to be a huge step forward. Um, but also just the browser UX. Uh, sign in with Ethereum's uh, protocol was specifically designed so that the message you sign would mean something to a human. You'd be able to read it and tell exactly what's going on, but also that it would be formatted so it would be easy for a machine to pass. And so there's a lot of opportunity for wallets, you know, MetaMask, uh, Rainbow, everyone else, to identify sign in with Ethereum messages and show a nice user-friendly dialogue that says, you know, this is what you need to know, we've checked it's a real message, you know, here's what you're signing in with, here's what permissions you're giving them. Same as you would see with like an OAuth dialogue for GitHub or Google or whatnot. Um, and I think that will, that's a big step forward from the text-based, you know, sign this message window. Great. I wanted to uh, touch point on the institutional partnership side, maybe the short term, medium term. Is there a way that, you know, we work together with a lot of the large, you know, tech companies or, you know, FinTech, TradFi, uh, or is this more kind of our siloed, you know, bottoms up kind of way of, of uh, starting a new movement here? Um, start with Justina. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I really hope that it's not going to be siloed and that we can collaborate um, with them. And yeah, I really do think it's really about understanding the challenges. Um, like, again, as I mentioned about, like, for example, um, even healthcare, which I think would be massive um, thing to potentially um, um, adopt these kind of uh, methods, um, we would be dealing with extremely sensitive data. So th these kind of institutions, they have another set of challenges that they have to solve. Also, we have data regulations that we have to take into account and like what does it mean then that um, users use their let's say with three wallets and then um, these kind of protocols um, and so on so um, yeah I, I hope that we can collaborate on understanding what kind of issues we have to address and uh, find solutions um, on that end and implement them um, and yeah I think that's really the only way how we can see more adoption on the institutional level so actually we're working with ceramic uh, so our vision is so the wallet is just in a sense the application right the private key and, and the mechanism for signing are the protocol 
Um, and that's really where the, I think the power lies. Uh, how good can you make the application though? So as I said at the moment, I think wallets are actually, it would be crude, but just they're pretty dumb at the moment. Smart contract wallets take you a step up, right? Because then you kind of, yes, you can get subscriptions and things like direct debits, right? More kind of refined modes of, of payment, um, not just single transactions. Um, but now imagine, and this is why we're working with Ceramic, um, being able to port data into uh, effectively a storage vault, if you want, uh, where you're also using the same private key as you would for your wallet to permission reads uh, for that vault. So now you're entering a world in which you've basically got a big digital backpack. So your wallet's now a data wallet, it's a digital backpack, so you can take that anywhere. And then people go, look, well, who are you? Have you turned up before? I wanna like, help you with session management, or maybe I wanna read your data because I wanna serve you ads. And you can go yes or no. Right? Now you've created this entirely different way of doing the same things, but it's decentralized. Right? You're, as the user, in control because you have that private key to say yes or no right? to, to people's requests out there, which is sort of, in a sense, what Apple are trying to do, saying, oh, do you want to be tracked? But, of course, they're managing all of those permissions. Uh, and it's not interoperable, right? And they're kind of locking out everyone else, right? It's centralized. The question is then how do you fill up those data vaults and, and that's the question that we've been working on uh, at Pool with a lot of other data unions, you know, how do you structure the, that data because you can't just expect people to dump stuff into there. Um, and then of course that becomes an even more valuable proposition for huge enterprises out there who go, oh right, now you're turning, now you're creating humans who we think are verified, they're turning up with data, we can tell a story from them. Right? We, they can also pay from the same application. We're jumping into Web3, right? It's not just, this is crypto, we could make some money off some speculation or NFTs, that's nice. You know, this is, a, it's like a 10x proposition, right? When you come to a data wallet. Nick, anything else there? Um, yeah, I think, you know, you, you asked originally about like, do we, you know, is this a silo thing? Is this, you know, just us? And I think we only really succeed if it's not. You know, ENS's vision is, is a Web3 uh, identity for, the, for everything. And I think that works best and, and sign in with Ethereum works best if it's everywhere. You know, ideally the UX improves and the, the number of users using Web3 wallets improves to the point where this is people's preferential sign in compared to Google or Twitter or whatnot because it's actually you have control of your data, you have control of your identity, you're not relying on a third party uh, identity provider to, to do it for you and to, to decide that you're allowed to continue to have an identity. Makes sense. Um, so I wanted to touch on the, the privacy piece a little bit. You mentioned a little bit about that. You know, we have a lot of sensitive data, a lot of kind of identity and credentials to, to think through here as well, uh, especially with use cases in, you know, supply chain in, in um, uh, hospitals, things like that. Um, could you talk through maybe some of the techniques we're using currently, including maybe zero knowledge proofs and other techniques that, you know, how are we working towards that right now? Um, yeah, so overall, um, like sign in with Ethereum overall is, um, offers a much more secure way to sign um, to message, uh, uh, sorry, to applications because they have a standardized message that uh, it produces and uh, overall it makes it uh, much harder to run phishing attacks. Um, so, uh, so that's uh, definitely a big improvement. Um, and uh, yeah, we really have to think about how we can pair that with um, other options like zero knowledge proof where users don't really have to prove that they um, like who they really are but we can um, only use for example their um, address or, or details that are stored in, in their decentralized identifier. Um, so I think overall the um, advantage of uh, signing with Ethereum is that every single um, user that owns a wallet they have a DID which then can be used to, to build out these kind of systems. Um, so maybe you can add a little bit more as well on the technicalities. Uh, yeah, I, th I think you covered it pretty, pretty thoroughly, really. Um, I haven't dealt with ZKPs and so on. They seem like a good application here, but I don't have deep experience, so I won't embarrass myself. <laughs> Just briefly for me, then I would say, look, if you're going to carry a data wallet uh, around, let's say, the metaverse, then, you know, you can start to see how zero-knowledge proofs protect uh, users' privacy. Uh, so for one short example, if you, let's say, you've managed to port all of your financial transaction data 
Um, but actually, most people on the other side just want to know how much you earn in a year. They don't want to know every single transaction you've made. And actually, they don't want to even keep that data anymore. It's just so much of a hassle from a GDPR perspective or CCPA. Um, so zero knowledge proof simply says, look, uh, I, you know, what is that number at the end of the day, right? Is it 70K, is it 20K, whatever it is, right? I just want to know. And that's, that's, a, that's one application. I think we're starting to, I know Vitalik's very enthusiastic about um, zero knowledge proofs and their applications, but we're still at the beginnings of this, I think. Uh, we're still building out actually the raw layer uh, for a data wallet in this, in this example, for example. Uh, Shiva, I also wanted to ask you about uh, the idea of data unions and kind of zero party data. Could you elaborate a little bit more on that and what you guys are, are working on there? Um, yeah, so in a sense, again, I mentioned data unions very briefly before. Um, zero party data is, in a sense, uh, it, it very much aligns with the sort of all sorts of kind of Web3 uh, notions. Um, so if you want, the nomenclature goes, first party data is data that a website has about you, right? It's their data, you turn up at their website, they know who you are, and you know, they have, a, a, again, you know, an identification about you, and then they're like, oh, look, they spent this much time on a website, this is what they read, this is what they did, et cetera, et cetera. Third-party data is basically people spying on you. Um, no one is proud of what's been created, but it's a huge ecosystem, but it's, a, it's being closed down literally as we speak. So, for example, you know, if you, anyone with an iPhone will have seen the update iOS 14.5 where they said, do you want this app to track you? And I'm pretty certain that, I mean, can I ask the audience? Like, who said yes to that? Who said yes to being tracked? Okay, literally no one. One, one person. Oh, one, that, that one guy. That <laughs> <laughs> Always a contrarian. Hounded out of this conference. <laughs> um, so, you know, that turned out that cost Facebook, for example, $10 billion. Um, because they're being locked out by Apple. And Apple is like rubbing their hands with glee going, privacy is great because now we can increase our advertising uh, revenue from 5 billion to 30 billion. So it's just a big play, right? But that's what they're using. So that's a state of third party. Zero party, uh, it says this, which is why don't we just work in conjunction with people who actually want to share and be pragmatic about sharing and monetizing their information. So as I said, there were about 120 data unions, probably about 30 to 40 of them are a position where they're, they're monetizing their data now. So they've got, I mean, I'll give you one example, like Sweatcoin is kind of interesting. Um, they're actually doing it in inverse and they're about to start monetizing their data uh, of their users. They've got 120 million downloads, 25 million sort of active users. Uh, Pogo is another really great example. They're in the web two, most of them traverse web two and web three. Um, I know Linden, one of the founders of Ozone is around. Uh, you know, so they're collecting all sorts of data, wellness data, uh, clickstream data, uh, and, and actually that whole space is about to open up massively. In 2024, March 2024, put it in your diary, um, the EU is about to give real-time portability rights to everyone, that's 450 million people in Europe, so you can port your Google, Facebook, Amazon, Apple data and more, and LinkedIn because it's Microsoft. <laughs> Um, uh, and that's just about to explode that ecosystem. So people can now say, this is my data. I'm porting it to a data union. That data union is going to be a fiduciary for me. This is zero party data now. It's coming direct from source. Let's monetize it. Sia, could you talk to some of what you're working on as well at Ceramic around this front? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, of course. Um, yeah, so as I mentioned, um, Ceramic is a decentralized data network and we really try to build out the infrastructure that um, developers can use to store, manage uh, user data. So just like she mentioned, it's like becomes your data backpack. So I think this is probably where I would definitely put Ceramic. Um, we definitely um, spend a lot of time thinking about how we can uh, build it in a secure way so that a user is um, the owner and has the ownership of their data. They can manage it. So uh, decentralized identifiers are at the core um, of how Ceramic works. And then uh, when users interact with applications that are built on Ceramic, uh, then uh, that is really the linking point uh, that uh, connects uh, user to the data streams that they are generating while interacting with the applications. Um, 
right now we are making some quite exciting updates uh, to ceramic so um, um, I will just quickly mention uh, we just released um, a developer preview of uh, compose DB so we are expanding um, the capabilities of what ceramic offers in terms of um, building applications in an easier way so now users can developers can define their um, application uh, schemas using GraphQL uh, that also opens uh, more opportunities to actually interact with their data uh, by curing the data using GraphQL um, APIs. Um, we are adding indexing and uh, relations so that um, you have a little bit more flexibility in terms of how um, developers can, can interact with the um, uh, data that is stored on, on ceramic. Um, and uh, yeah, we also uh, doubling down on making sure that uh, data that is stored on ceramic is composable. Um, so um, what that means for a developer, um, like if you build on ceramic and you build a data model, so basically define uh, the scheme of the model, uh, you can uh, share the model on um, what we call model discovery so that other developers that are potentially building um, similar application or something that they just simply need a specific feature or uh, the model that already exists, they don't have to build it from scratch, they can take uh, something that exists on a, um, a model discovery uh, platform and, uh, and use it for their application or if they need some additional uh, functionality there, they can update the models and uh, then also share uh, with the community. So we re really try to make um, more um, that development more community driven and allow developers to help each other to uh, build faster and, and better applications. Um, and uh, yeah, also data interoperability as well is uh, something that we really take uh, seriously and um, um, make sure that um, data, for example, if user created a profile on an application that was built on ceramic uh, because their data is um, linked to their decentralized identifier, that means that they can take their profile or uh, let's say, I don't know, if it's a Web3 social application, um, uh, their followers and bring it to a different application that uh, runs on ceramic as well. So those are the things that we're working on. Uh, some of them are early stages. We love developers to try it out, uh, share feedback um, and uh, help us build it better. Exciting stuff. Um, I was going to say, if people don't know, the secret source of ceramic really is, f f certainly from our perspective, is that you can deal in real-time data. So you, like IPFS is great for static stuff, right? One-off, like I'm going to store this, that's great. If you want a persistent stream, then you've got a different problem, right? Because you're going to have to kind of rewrite and rewrite and rewrite, and that's going to cost a lot, and it's horribly inefficient, obviously. Um, so and that's, for us at least, that's like the basic uh, thing for why ceramic is really a, a, a huge way forward in all of this. Perfect. Um, let's, let's talk about uh, on the consumer end with monetization of data and, and after sign-in and you know, kind of that whole user experience from end to end. Uh, what's like the, I guess the grand ridge, I know you guys talked about this a little bit, but you know, with ENS, let's say, and, and cross-chain and monetization with brands, let's say, you know, how, how do you think about that kind of like blue, blue, uh, blue sky vision? Um, I guess Monetization is kind of furthest from our from our minds in some respects. We've always built ENS with sort of building a public good in mind. And so, you know, we're aware that people monetize things, but we try and keep it as, you know, as, as decentralized and independent as possible. Um, so we sort of, it's more a platform that people can build monetizable ideas on than, than something monetizable in and of itself. Um, I think it, when, it, when it comes with sign in, to sign in with Ethereum, it, it you know provides access to all these platforms as well, but it hasn't been our core focus historically. Uh, like, can I ask uh, Nick a question? Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. um, I was just going to say, just, you know, obviously you were one of the original authors of, what is it, EIP, is it 3165? Uh, possibly, there's so many of them. You can't remember. No, <laughs> as in this original sort of CWE yes. uh, protocol, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> okay. Um, and we, as it stands at the moment, how, where do you see it going in terms of it needing updating, refreshing, mm -hmm. you know, coming back to it, and, yep. you know, what are its flaws? Um, I think, like, it was built with extensibility in mind reasonably well. You know, the, the format of the message you sign uh, allows optional fields, allows apps to specify individual things. Wallets can then support those as time goes on. So I'm hopeful that 
the way it will be updated is by publishing additional specs that add functionality through those mechanisms we already have, rather than needing changes to the base protocol. Uh, at least if we did our job, that will be you know, the goal. There's always the possibility of CW2, but maintaining backward compatibility, I think, is really important, because in some sense, whenever you don't, you start from scratch. You know, it's never quite as hard as the first time, but you spend an awful lot of effort just getting back to where you were in terms of adoption and so on, you know, whenever you release something new that everyone has to support. Uh, so I want to pivot slightly towards uh, the idea of, you know, soulbound tokens and kind of how we can compare and contrast between signing with Ethereum and, and you know, Vitalik's SB token approach. Um, do you want to talk about that, Mal? Uh, Shiv. God, yeah, this is, so soulbound tokens is obviously, um, you know, it was put forward by uh, Vitalik and Glenn Weil and one other author, Priyanka, I think it's Priyanka, I forget her name, this is really terrible. Um, it's always the third person who drops off that list in terms of you remembering. Um, and I don't know, I, I don't know if it's a very, so the, the idea is basically you have tokens that are um, inherently bound, soul bound, uh, to someone's address, right? So they, in a sense, in essence, can't really be transferred, uh, become meaningless after that. I don't know, Nick, if you want to kind of elaborate more on a technical perspective. Um, and, and that is, in essence, wrapped up with your identities. And I think from, a, like, if you take a kind of, you know, uh, <clears throat> uh, a much higher perspective, uh, just sort of step out, it's good at recording moments. In a sense, it's not too different from POAPs, if people know the value of that, where you're like, taking a, um, from a, from a storytelling perspective, you're like, you're capturing a photo and you're like, here's this moment, it's perfectly captured, great. And it says something about you at that moment. What it isn't really doing, it's kind of leaving a trail of breadcrumbs for other people to then put together a story. And, and in a sense, it's not too different from, um, I mean, it's got other applications, but this is from a kind of data perspective. Um, it, 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 or from an identity perspective, um, people's identities are far more fluid and actually involve a, 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 you know, a good many more things. Uh, and, and, you know, so if you just told your story, if you want through photographs to carry on that metaphor, you'd end up with kind of, you know, a kind of Instagram-ish world. But that doesn't really tell the richness in terms of digitally, digital storytelling perspective of everything that's going on, all the stuff that you wouldn't, in fact, actually really capture. Um, and, and, and the humdrum of data that's produced about people is sometimes incredibly useful, uh, not just to external parties, but to you, right? It very few applicate, anyway, I won't go, go, go down that route, but I think that's the difference between this kind of soul-bound token approach, which has crossovers with POAPs, NFTs, etc., and something maybe a bit richer, um, which is let's take real-time continuous information from the applications that people use and then, and then store that in a ceramics-style data vault, right? Um, I, I think that's, that's, for me, a much more holistic approach to that. I don't know, Nick. Yeah, I guess the, the most basic version, the most basic view of the soulbound token is just, it's an NFT that can't be transferred. But that falls for the, you know, a couple of common misapprehensions that uh, an Ethereum address uniquely re represents a user and that it never changes. And neither of those is true. You know, all of us here probably have multiple wallets. Uh, probably most or all of us here have the experience of moving from one main wallet to another. And if you have a truly like um, non-transferable token, then you leave your identity behind when you do that. And from a security point of view, the last thing we want to do is discourage people from making advisable updates and moving to more secure wallets and, and key storage and stuff. Um, but I think the more sophisticated view of the soulbound token is that it is effectively non-separable. So if you have one that represents uh, you know, your, your national identity and one that represents your membership of an association and so forth, you can't transfer one to one place and another to another place. You can move, but you have to move as a whole. You, know, you can't split your identity into pieces. Um, and a, a different approach to that, uh, which I'm quite fond of, is, is attestations. And particularly if you tie them to an identity such as an ENS name, because you transfer the ENS name to a new account, uh, and all of your attestations come with you because they're pointing at, you know, that this name is over 18, this name is a, is a citizen of New Zealand, and so on and so forth. Um, and the attestations are, are cheaper too, because you don't need to put them on chain. You can put revocations on chain, but you just need to sign message that says this authority asserted that this fact is true about this ENS name. Um, and you can collect them and you can hand them out and you can have privacy over them as well. In a sense, you know, again, it comes down to the fundaments of what 
uh, identity is, how we not only want to build it, but like, what is it? Like going back to like, who are people? People are complicated things. Uh, and, and to kind of, you know, are we taking this kind of um, almost staccatic approach? Uh, or are we going to have continuous streams where we realize, yes, you know, these things are sort of fluid, and uh, but we can tell a kind of more interesting uh, story. And obviously people, yeah, do want to shift. People's identities inherently do change. We're not static beings in that sense. Um, and I guess, you know, it's a good, I felt like the whole, the, the, the Solvan tokens are incredibly good theoretical exercise, but from a UX perspective, just like the worst in a sense to implement <laughs> because humans are complicated in that sense. Right, right. Um, Justine, could you talk to maybe some of the use cases with, let's say, AI or advertisers and, you know, um, just different ways to, to kind of combine, um, you know, signing in and, and artificial intelligence? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> overall, um, uh, that's a massive topic. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Tiny question. <laughs> Probably would take uh, an entire hour to talk about that. Um, like overall, um, I'll try to make this quick and short. Um, I think most of people here are familiar with um, problems with um, AI and, and uh, driving insights from data in, in Web2. Um, I'm speaking about uh, users uh, giving up uh, their data ownership, um, these big companies that have uh, algorithms that are being trained on their data uh, do most of their work in a closed source, so there is no way to really tell what is happening uh, behind that. And then, um, again, like if uh, you use traditional sign-in methods, um, you give out like entire network of your interactions with different applications. Then on the other side, there is another um, um, challenge for developers, uh, specifically in Web2, um, that I've seen so many times. Like if you are a smaller company and you don't have massive user base, like for example, Google or, or, or Facebook, um, you have two main problems. One of them, you might not have a big enough team to build out these um, advanced systems. And uh, another problem is that most of the data is extremely siloed. So um, if you don't have access to these massive data pools, you are quite limited in terms of how good those um, ML or AI systems can be. But at the same time, let's be honest, um, these algorithms that we interact with on a daily basis, like for example, YouTube recommendation algorithm that gives you suggestions for the next video to watch, they are pretty good, and uh, I'm sure that everyone appreciates uh, the experience that they provide. Um, so, overall, I think looking at Web3 and, uh, like, for example, uh, these uh, sign-in methods from um, um, Ethereum uh, side, I think there is a really great opportunity to do these kind of things a little bit better, although, although at the same time, I, I feel like it's really early days, um, because... Um, Applications that are currently on Web3, um, they are not very feature rich. And to train those kind of uh, systems, obviously you need data. But what I'm uh, really hopeful with uh, signing with Ethereum about, again, I mentioned that session management, which should open up the doors for um, more feature rich applications. Again, I mentioned gaming uh, applications, Web3 social, and that should um, allow more. Um, Web3 apps to potentially have some kind of um, uh, sprinkle of, of machine learning systems there to improve user experience. And then at the same time, there is a massive uh, interest right now in decentralized finance, decentralized machine learning as well. And there are some methods there already that should allow um, uh, users to interact with uh, these machine learning systems uh, based uh, built on a blockchain without giving out their data and instead, for example, um, sharing uh, the weights of the model that is being trained. I will not go too much detail into technical uh, details there. But basically, I think there are opportunities there to hopefully get to at least similar user experience in Web3 as well compared to Web2, or maybe even better, but there is still a lot of work that needs to be done uh, to enable developers to build these quite advanced and feature-rich applications on Web3. But sign-in with Ethereum, is, I think, is getting us there. Thanks. Sure. Uh, I won't add much. I know we've got to ask the, might want to ask the audience a bunch of questions, or they might have questions for us, um, I should say. Uh, I just add this, I think, I don't really think you get 
AI and something like the metaverse serving humanity unless you have, if you want, decentralized session management and sign in with Ethereum. Uh, I, I think it just the, the, that vision just goes um, into a really dark place unless you have that base uh, layer sorted in terms of protocol. Perfect. Anything to add? No? Okay. Uh, is there any questions from the audience? Just wanted to check. We have about five minutes remaining. Yes, right there. Uh, can we bring the mic? Uh, I have a quick question for Nick. Uh, are you going to support automatic renewal for ANS uh, or no? Sorry, automatic? Uh, renewal of uh, a specific ANS. Ah, um, the the problems with that are in terms of getting user authorization and, and payment from the wallet. Um, it's possible, but a bit awkward. Uh, I'd be happy to chat with you about it out of band, though. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Anyone else have a question? Right here. Uh, quick question about, uh, I think, the legal side. Um, have any of you spoken to governments, um, discussed, I guess, legislation that could help, uh, I want to say, release this data and information so that we can bring it onto Ethereum? Um, I can take that briefly, which is to say, this is how sad I am. During the pandemic, uh, so right at the start, May 2020, um, I was in just talking to a lot of people from Brussels because their worries were, um, they realized basically GDPR didn't do the other bit, which they hoped it would do, which is to break the back of kind of Google and Facebook's monopoly. Because from their perspective, these are these Silicon Valley companies and it's not really their vision either of a bit more of a decentralized or kind of, you know, where the power is spread, at least to some European companies. Um, so the rules that are now coming out in March 2024 were kind of a result of that. Lots of other people, actually, even a few people from Web3 were involved in those discussions. So that's now resulted in real-time data portability being a right. So at the moment, it's just portability rather than retail, real-time portability. Um, so people can now, instead of sending an email saying, I want to get all my data, and then it comes back 30 days later in a JSON file, it's like sign in to a third party, use OA, o OAuth in a sense, in fact, use their tools against them, it's great. Um, and then you'll be able to port your data to a third party to whomever you nominate. And so that's at least what's come as a result of, of that, um, which is bloody fantastic. Uh, it means the silos for Google uh, and Facebook are about to be, in a sense, ripped down. We're, we're about to witness a, you know, a vast experiment, uh, certainly in Europe. And then they can't imagine like, Americans standing by going, oh, yeah, well, these Europeans can do all this stuff with their data, and like, we just have to like, lump it. Um, you know, <laughs> at least, at least uh, I'm not American. Um, so uh, I don't know how, how well, let's see how that goes down. Do you have anything to add there? Um, yeah, Sorry. no, th that's a great question. I think overall, um, like we didn't speak too much about like technical uh, details of sign in with Ethereum, but I think it does uh, make it easier to follow certain legislations and think about like what will be happening with user data um, because again, like user becomes the owner of their um, decentralized identifier, which then when linked with, let's say, data storage systems, still allows them to manage their data in a way and it's not being shared with like anyone online. Um, so I think uh, these kind of methods that we have being implemented um, should make it easier and the same applies to, for example, NFTs are um, quite often also used for uh, as uh, decentralized identifiers, but the problem is that they are uh, public, they are on chain. Um, so with options like sign in with Ethereum, we can now leverage more of off chain uh, applications as well for data storage and so on. So that makes it, I think in general, easier to um, be compliant with um, legislations and, and rules out there. Makes sense. Do you have anything else to add? Yeah, I guess, uh, you know, things like GDPR are all about how companies that have your data can share it with third parties and things like sign in with Ethereum and decentralized profiles give you that control. So in a way they obsolete it and they, they, they're a very good way to be compliant with it, like the zero party data you were talking about, Shiv. Anything else from the audience? Yes, one more. Hi. Oh, cool. Two questions. Yes. Um, first one. 
for people who want to contribute to sign in with Ethereum, what is a good hub to like reach out and help build it? And second question, is the word Ethereum a limiting factor for adoption and maybe like sign in with a private key or self-sovereign identity, a more appealing button to add next to sign in with Google or something? Yeah. Um, yeah, no, that's a, a really good question. In terms of contributing, um, Spruce uh, are good people to talk to, and the sign in with Ethereum site, which I th think is seaweed.eth as well as there's a non decentralized version, uh, has a lot of information about how to contribute and get involved. Um, I agree, it's like it's a difficult thing because technically you're not signing in with Ethereum, you're signing in with your crypto identity, which happens to be the one that we use for Ethereum and so forth. Um, but I guess it's difficult to compress that into a four-letter acronym, uh, and we're, we're kind of stuck with it for now. But um, you're right, it's much broader than just Ethereum. I think we should be, like, super proud of that fact, <laughs> right? Like, and, and we can call it Siwi, and we haven't been calling it Siwi on stage. Maybe we should have done that a bit more. Um, but no, I'm like, you know, I want to know from websites, as soon as I had that Uniswap experience and the Aave experience, I was like, why isn't every other website like that? Like, I want to know, like, prod them and go, why, are, why can't I just sign in with my wallet? I don't want you to make me use Google, right? That sucks. It really sucks. I feel bad. It's a bad experience, and I get nothing out of it. Totally agreed. All right, looks like we're out of time today. Thank you so much for coming out, and uh, let's give it up for our panel. <laughs>